Okay. Um, good evening, colleagues. Um, I'm going to present an abridged summary of the CV of Dr. Siva Pele. I think that we'd have to apply for extra CPD points if I had to present his entire CV. Um, Dr. Siva Pele completed his undergraduate medical education at Madras University in India. He completed postgraduate vocational training programs through the College of Medicine of South Africa and Medunsa, where he obtained his MFGP and MFAMID. Of note, and for the purposes of this lecture, he has completed cert certification from the Fetal Medicine Foundation and is also a member of the South African Society of Ultrasound for Obstetricians and Gynecologists and also in the International Society of Ultrasound for Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Dr. Siva Pillay has a vast, um, has vast work experience and many special interests covering a wide range of areas across the medical political spectrum. He cites on his CV and we all know that he has expertise in managed care, um, national health policy and planning, PPPs or public-private partnerships, social health insurance, national health insurance, risk equalization, etc. He has been on the Executive Council for Medical Schemes as well. To add to all of this, he has been the mayor of the first transitional local council in Utnek in the 1994-95 period. He has been a member of parliament in the National Assembly in 2009-2010. And from 2010 to 2013, he was the head of department of the East Cape Department of Health. He was also appointed superintendent general of the East Cape Department of Health. We achieved numerous successes in his tenure. You see me lists that he has been um, junior national champion in full contact karate in 1973. And he has achieved first dan black belt in full contact karate. So he's not somebody to mess with. Um, he also lists gardening, water features and landscaping as part of his um, special interests. He is a enthusiast of Japanese koi fishing and he also enjoys cooking and scuba diving as other interests. Jeff, did you hear that? Continue, Sean. Yeah. Um, did you get, uh, I'm, I'm done. Did, did it come through? Uh, you, uh, you just got cut off at scuba diving. No, we're done this. So I'm, I'm going to present Dr. Siva Pillay that can take over from here. And he's going to give us some confidence to manage our antenatal patients. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sean, for um, that introduction. Uh, we're trying to get Dr. Siva Pele unmuted. So I'm going to just try. Oh, there's unmuted. Okay. Siva. Um... Should I go? Right. We can hear you. And you then should be able to present, uh, share your screen. I can see that. Great. Uh, just one minute. Let me just leave something. Okay. First thing first, uh, let me uh, declare that I have uh, no conflict of interest. Uh, there's nobody with financial interest in this presentation. And this presentation is 
is, is just my own presentation that I thought that uh, people may be interested in. Uh, and, uh, uh, and that's why I asked Jeff and the guys to say, oh, I can look at it. Just give me one second, Jeff. I just need to just clear out some things here, which I'm not able to do. Uh, Okay, it doesn't matter. How do you get rid of view, 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 where's view? Okay, let's go. I'm just gonna go like this. The purpose of this talk is to create an awareness of the current standard of care. I know that many people are GPs, but uh, uh, the hope of this talk is to say that uh, pregnancy does start when the person gets pregnant and I'm hoping that we be proactive in managing patients before they even try to fall pregnant and things like that. Uh, the, also, the purpose of this talk is to improve the district health service that we have here with some training programs. And I'm also saying that in the shortage of now specialists doing obstetric care, there may be GPs that may be interested in doing at least the uh, antenatal care part of, of, uh, of care for which you don't have to pay the insurance or anything. And if we do that, how we can put groups together to skill ourselves. And the take home message today is to say the absolute potential of screening and being proactive in the way we manage the patients. The reason I'm giving this talk is that most of the times when the patients reach us, the horse has bolted and we are trying to close the stable door after the horse has bolted. And if we can get people to be proactive and to, to, to to do things before the patients uh, are referred to the specialists, we can do so much better. And that's the purpose of this talk and I hope it will be received as, as such. The talk is presented in the first part is what is the standard of care? I'm giving two slides on what you can do for training, but the rest of the slides is basically directed at general practitioners to say, before a patient decides to fall pregnant, which we call pre-conceptual care, which is totally in your domain, and what we should look at and what will be the standard of care there. So I hope it's taken as such. Okay, uh, at the current uh, times, you know, expectations are high. Everybody wants a positive outcome. Uh, and at the present moment, litigation is high. And we have a unique problem. I don't know whether the rest of the country, but in the Nelson Mandela Port Elizabeth area, uh, the number of people doing obstetrics now from the specialists is diminishing and we just got few specialists that are doing obstetrics and all are opting to just do gynae and not provide obstetric care. Secondly, the radiologists now have also decided that no, nope, they are not even going to do the ultrasounds for us. So even if you say, I suspect a person is pregnant and you send them at 11 weeks and you say, I think query ectopic, they will just send you intrauterine pregnancy referred to specialists. They won't even tell you how far the pregnancy is or whatever it is. So the radiologists have also opted out of this. And as such, uh, if I had to talk from a business point of view, there is a huge opportunity for GPs here because of one reason, the insurance for GPs is not as high as that for obstetricians. The obstetricians now, the insurance is about 870,000 rands in MPS, I don't know what the others. But if you're a GP and you're not doing intrapartum obstetrics, you still pay the same GP rates, but you can do everything. And this is an opportunity for you to manage patients. If you look at Nelson Mandela Bay at the present moment, and Louis is on the line and he will testify to this, uh, uh, the obstetricians that are there, they are not doing the 13 week scans and the 20 week scans so much. They refer it to Rene, myself and Louis. And uh, we as GPs and, and, and Rene as a radiographer are doing this. So this is something that you, is, is an opportunity for people if they try to skill themselves, it is a huge opportunity for them to uh, come into a niche market. Lastly, I wanted to say now we have another problem is that this low cost medical aid is limiting the number of specialist consultations. They'll say you've got four specialist consultations and three specialist consultations. What does the patient do in between? So it's gonna come back to the GP and you have to be a fair with the current uh, uh, level of care so that you can take care of your patients. I want to stress the fact that obstetrics at the present moment is a preventative measure. It is to prevent, predict, detect, and manage. So it's preventative care to a big extent and little extent should be about monitoring. 
We have the opportunity to reassure patients, do education, support the women and the family, deal with minor complications. But today what I want to specifically talk to say is that in antenatal care, there is a great need for screening, being proactive in our management and managing patients before they, uh, uh, they get into problems. So, so this is what I wanted to, to talk about today. And obviously the outcome that we're looking at is a healthy baby and healthy mother. There is a thing that is called Barker's hypothesis that to say that if you take care of the mother and the baby early in pregnancy and before even when they fall pregnant, then you will prevent later adult illness in this baby. And because there's a postulus, post, postulation that if the baby intrauterine is compromised, then for the rest of the adult life, they become problematic. I participated in a multi-center study on breaking, breaking the link in diabetes. And we showed that if you treat mothers properly, no matter genetic disposition and family disposition, you can prevent uh, diabetes from being vertically transmitted. And that is something that's something that, that should be known. Same way we are saying, I, I'll give you some examples of cases, you can prevent the baby from getting into complications of adult illness by managing the antenatal care properly. This is the new concept that has come out where in the olden days, we looked at patients, we called them in and we looked at 16 weeks, 24, 28, 32 weeks, and we said, come every four weeks and look at them. And as things happen and unfold, we reacted. The new concept of care now is reversing the pyramid. It says, pick the patients up early, go to an early pregnancy assessment center, to people like Louis online, to Rene, uh, to myself and others, have yourselves evaluated at 12 to 13 weeks. Then get classified based on your prior risk about whether you are high risk or low risk. If it's low risk, you just continue. But at every point in time when you are followed up, the risk is reclassified. And the moment you come into high risk, then you go into specialized care. And changing the pyramid of care is more effective in proactively managing. I have added one more concept, which you saw the red thing flashing and I was saying, even though we're saying reverse the pyramid of care, I'm saying, let's look at pre-conceptual care. Because if I can get the mother healthy before she even falls pregnant, then I have achieved much more. And that is where the purpose of the talk today to say how we can look at it. Our father of fetal medicine is uh, 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 Nicolaitis. Kipros Nicolaitis, and he has come back with the Fetal Medicine Foundation and is a fantastic philanthropist to have set up this whole structure that where people can go online, educate themselves, link onto the Fetal Medicine Foundation. It is totally free. And you get a comprehensive training program, which we support with some of us here, uh, where you can look at it and you can get online certification. And I wanted to say to people, GPs, you need to take this opportunity to look at this because this is a huge opportunity for you to look at that. For this talk, I've given three resources. So if people are interested after this talk and they want to find information, the one which is our go-to site is the Fetal Medicine Foundation. That's the, 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 the site. If you want information to give to your patients and you want you know, like, uh, to tell patients what is screening, to tell patients what is gonna happen in a cesarean section, even you want to look at in a consent where you're taking consent, then you better go to the Sassog, Sassog uh, Better Ops program, and they got a whole lot of patient material. Jeff circulated some document that I put, which I modified about antenatal screening and what we do. And those came from the Better Ops program that is there. But my go-to site, and I think everybody may not know it, but you look at it, is the FOXI. FOXI is the Federation of Obstetrics and Gynecological Society of India. This is a federation of, of, of 144 societies, and they are producing papers every day. And their level of research now has reached such a standard. Uh, if on any topic, if you want anything, they, you'll, you can go to the Foxy site and you'll find it. And a lot of what I'm gonna to talk to you about comes up from the site. They are cutting edge in, 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 in research now. And many of the things that are, are out in the, uh, uh, 
in, in the international societies are coming now from 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 Fox, Foxy, and then it's 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 taken from there. So the objective of this talk is to you know, talk about what is the standard of care. The objectives of the standard of care is to define the health of the mother and the fetus, to confirm that the pregnancy is intrauterine, to check for early dating, rule out complications of ectopic pregnancy, twin pregnancy. If it's a twin pregnancy, it is imperative that at the early stage, you know whether it's monochorionic, dichorionic, uh, monoamniotic, diamniotic, or, or what to look at cervical incompetence. And one thing that I want to talk about today is how much you can prevent miscarriages. Looking at prevention of PET and uterine artery flows, and then how to risk rate uh, pregnancies. You know, to look at fetal aneuploidy, to look at neurotube defects, preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, stillbirths, miscarriages, macrosomia, and other illness. Don't get confused about a lot of these things. I'll show you the links to it. It's very simple, you can do it. The standard of care and the objective is to initiate a plan for your patients for continued delivery. If a patient comes and sits to you and you're a GP and, and the patient is, is, is eight weeks old and you phone a specialist and he says, uh, send the patient uh, in two months time and that's the time you get an appointment, it's too late. So then you've got to make an alternative plan. The alternative plan is in Port Elizabeth, it must be Rene Dubel or, or my good friend Louis who's online and I'm hoping he will speak a little bit later. And you can send the patients to them for the early screening up to 13 weeks and make sure that by the time they reach the specialist, everything is done for them. Uh, you have to look at a vaccination plan and, and, uh, and a further screening plan, and you have to look at pregnancy education by the time they reach the specialist. Vaccination I'll speak to later, but it is absolutely important. Now, when you talk about screening and prophylaxis, these are the screenings that we do. It may look complicated or anything, but if uh, those who get the presentation, if you just go and click on the site, uh, you'll open up to the internet and you, you, you'll get the screening protocols. And then, yeah, you come to the Fetal Medicine Foundation, you just have to write whether it's a singleton pregnancy, what is the crown lump length, uh, what is the height, weight, racial origin, whether the person smokes and this, and then you do calculate in the end, it gives you a risk rating. You can do this to then find out if this person is a high risk or not. And if it is an iris, then you need to pick up a phone, phone me, phone Louis, phone Renee, and say, listen, I've got this iris patient. I've got only time for a specialist at this time. So can you look at this patient and do the rest for us? We will do that for you with open arms. And, and, and surprise, surprise, at the present moment, in our sub-district in Utene, I have trained now three, uh, four midwives uh, as of yesterday we're now fully certified and we've got ultrasounds in the local clinics at Leticia Baum and Rosedale, and they can actually do this for you. So it is, uh, it is not something that is far-fetched, it's something that can be done and you can look at it. And here's all the different types of screening that you can do. I don't wanna talk about any of the screenings now because those are topics on their own. And I'm hoping that this whole thing will be an ongoing thing and Jeff will call better people who are competent than me to talk uh, in future about these things so that the GPs can get a fair with it. There are specific screenings also. If a person is a European uh, Caucasian or a European Jew, then there is cystic fibrosis that you need to screen for tachysex disease. If it comes from Mediterranean descent, you've got to look at thalassemia, sickle cell anemia. If the person is of South African Indian origin, unless tested otherwise, they are diabetic. <laughs> uh, uh, if you've got some Dutch and Swedish descendants now, for Friday as a big thing, the Van Doyens, Van Nikek. When I see Van Doyen, Van Nikek, immediately I send for Pofide as screening because uh, you just don't want to get that there. In a visit, and this is what I wanted to say to you, when a person comes to you the first time, you have to take a thorough history. You just cannot say the patient is pregnant and just refer because at this point in time, we don't have specialists immediately. So you've got to take a thorough history, obstetric history, gynae history, medical history, what medicines the person is taking, immunization history, occupational, whether they're exposed to toxic substances. Look at the BP, if you can get mid-arm circumference. Now, I wanted to say about BP. BP must be taken in the sitting position in both arms, uh, and then you take the mean arterial pressure, height, weight, visidex. You should do your general observation. If possible, a vaginal uh, uh, examination, pap smears, if you can do it there. You should know what are the lab uh, results that you should take so that uh, uh, by the time they reach the specialist, you can do this. I, I want to emphasize this, and I'll give you a copy later of a, of a, a requisition form because you can do the basic lab, 
tests, including the, uh, the uh, Down syndrome neural tube defects screening. And you will know whether the person is high risk or low risk before you even refer. And so you can do that. You should determine what the screening protocol, the ultrasound plan is, at least a 13 week scan and a 20 week scan, get the patient booked. And it's an opportunity for mother and father education. What I wanted to say here in this standard of care, maybe I'll come to it later again. At the present moment, by 13 weeks, we have the ability to detect all these things. We have the ability to detect who is a diabetic patient and what is the risk for diabetes to 99%. And if nothing else today, if I can convince you to be aware of, of, of uh, PET and, 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 and treat these patients, then that is something. 91%, if nothing else you listen to today, listen to this, 91% prediction for PET, and you can prevent it by 91% early onset PET, that is late onset PET still comes through, but early onset PET, uh, uh, you can predict by 91%. And if the important thing is that you should start treatment before 14 weeks to 15 weeks, otherwise it's ineffective. And that is why this is the purpose of one of the reasons that I wanted to talk today was to say, guys, you'll need to implement this because you can do this. By 20 weeks, you can predict all of this. Now, if you looked at my previous slide, these are not like 20% or 30%. These are all over 90%. So if it can be done, then you need to do it. In terms of the current standard of care, by six to nine weeks, you should confirm whether the pregnancy is intrauterine or extrauterine. You should confirm early dating. Now, there are more than 20 guys in Port Elizabeth that I know that have got ultrasounds. Now, if you cannot get to the radiologists who are refusing to do this, and you cannot get to the specialists who are refusing to do this and give you early appointments, we can train those people so that at least these kind of things can be done. At the present moment, I need to say to you, so many miscarriages can be prevented. And any patient with a history of miscarriage must be given priority because you don't want this person to get a repeated miscarriage. And it's so easy to do this because if you can do the fetal viability testing, uh, and, and that's a simple thing, is if you're going to do a beta HCG and you're doing a quantitative beta HCG, just do a serial beta HCG, repeat it in 48 hours. If it doubles, you know the baby is growing well. You don't have to then worry too much. But if you just do one beta HCG, it's not as effective because it, you cannot tell the person whether the, the pregnancy is continuing well or not. By eight to 11 weeks, you need to send bloods out for a triple test, and that is in your domain. And I'll show you a form that you can use uh, that can help you to do this testing and, and so that you, you can do it even before you refer to the specialist. You can do the baseline measurements and including of the dating and the antenatal booking with everybody. You can prepare the patient for the 11 to 13 week scan. And where the patient can afford it and where the medical aids are paying for this, uh, there is a non-invasive test, it's called NIPT, non-invasive pre-testing, which just by a blood test, uh, it gives you quite a lot of information and even genetic screening if you want. And if the persons want to do that, then you have to arrange that because there's no points of waiting for the specialist. Then at 20 weeks, we do NIPT when you can do this at 10 weeks itself. In terms of the standard of care, the 11, and 13, 11 to 13 week scan, is very, very important because at this point you have the ability to predict a wide variety of illnesses, complications by non-invasive real-time point of care uh, information that you have. If you take a thorough history, do maternal characteristics, do the biophysicals and ultrasound uh, findings, get your biochemical findings and you can screen the patient and know what it is. Then in the terms of the standard of care, between 18 and 22 weeks, you should do an anomaly scan uh, and do which, in which you will do cervical length. Now, because of obesity, and any patient with a BMI over 35 must get a di diabetes screen at 18 to 22 weeks. So that's there. For those who want to know, and this is there, this is pre-conceptual care, this side, this is the screening, this is a screening chart. You can download this on the internet. It tells you what you should do when, and it gives you what you need to do. I want to say to you at the present moment, Louis is sitting there, he can tell you he's a GP, I'm a GP. It is not difficult to get certified by the Fetal Medicine Foundation. It, it requires a little bit of other time. You can do it. We are having classes here uh, in PE. I have now certified yesterday, my fourth midwife got certified. And not only for the, for the uh, new, uh, NT 
and 13 week scan, but they got certified for the fetal anomaly scan, which is also a little difficult. But if the nurses can do it, you can do it. And Jeff, I'm saying if the guys are interested, if you can get eight or nine guys, we can put something together. We have a DVD that we can give you, which is your basic obstetrics ultrasound training. We've, this DVD is available. If you just phone my rooms, they will even email it to you. I mean, they will courier it to you, whatever. And it gives you a step-by-step -step method of, of learning and training, which can give you the skills that you need. So I, I think I want to stop there about screening and what is the standard of care. My main purpose of the talk today is what is the minimum standard of care for a GP prior to referring a patient. You need and to take a thorough history of the patient so that you can risk rate the patient. You should know that this patient maybe had two miscarriages before. She's had a, a infertility, she had cysts, which she had laparoscopies. Uh, she's got chronic medication. She's a chronic diabetes or chronic hypertension. She has got an incomplete immunization history, so we need to do that. This person is smoking. Uh, this person is working maybe in Goodyear work, exposed to trichloroethylene, which is a toxic substance, uh, and things like that. This person may be working in the radiation department, and, and so things like that. You can then do the biophysical checkups. You can do these general examinations. And the most important thing is the routine blood screening. Uh, for those who are staying in our area, I just need to say to you, it is so easy to do this. We have designed the form for you. And if you go both to PathCare and AMPAT, you just have to fill up this form. It tells you antenatal blood, Down syndrome, neural tubes. There's very little things that you have to fill. You have to just say, what is the ethnicity? What is their previous Down syndrome or neural tube defects? Does the patient have diabetes? Does the patient smoke? Is it a twin pregnancy? What is the gestational? What is the weight? What's it the IVF? Yes or no? And if you... Yes. Eva, you've gone off a uh, slideshow and... Okay, okay. Uh, let me come back uh, to this. So I'm just saying to you, uh, um, if you if you are in Port Elizabeth, you can you can come to us here and we've got a special form that is that PathCare and AMPAT can give you and you can then ask for these tests to be done and they will do everything for you. And they will give you... Uh, uh, a risk rating which says to you that uh, this person is high risk or low risk for a, a group of things, including PET, including uh, uh, Down syndrome neural tubes. Uh, if you do this, there is a financial benefit for you as GPs also. You can charge a prolonged consultation for this. You can charge really a prolonged because this takes a lot of time to do and to get all the information. And the, and the medical aid, if you say first uh, a pregnancy visit, and you charge a prolonged consultation, they will pay for it. Very rarely, they do, they do not pay for it. They will, they will ask you to also, please register the patients for antenatal care and, and pregnancy, and they'll pay you a prolonged consultation. So it's in your interest to do this, you can do this. What is the investigations that you have to do? I don't want to go through this list now, but this is the investigations that you have to do. Now, everything that I have marked in red is what you can do for the patient at 11 weeks. You can do the dual markers, you can do the PLGF, you can do all of these things so that by the time they reach the specialists or by the time they go for further care, you have done all of these things such that you have prepared the patient antenatal for, for what is going to happen and then you can take it. My purpose of the talk today is preconceptual care. If I can change the paradigm that it is 12, not nine months pregnancy, I have succeeded. Then I will sleep peacefully tonight. I know that what I did to prepare the slides and the sweat I put in was worth it. Pregnancy is not a nine months affair. It is a 12 month affair because three months before the person falls pregnant, you need to prepare this patient. You need to make sure that she is healthy. You have to make sure that everything is done for the patient. And this is in your domain as, as GPs. Uh, it is not the specialist who's going to do this because by the time you refer them, uh, you're the, this you have lost, it's a missed opportunity. Now, what is preconceptual care? It's a set of promotive, preventative management interventions that aim to identify, modify biomedical, behavioral, and, and social risks to, women, to women's health and to improve pregnancy outcomes. As I said, this is in the GP domain. The goal here is to optimize the woman's health, minimize risk to the mother and the baby, improve 
pregnancy outcomes, give information so that they can make informed choices in reproduction. Now you may ask why, why do we need this? Adverse pregnancy outcomes is still prevalent to, despite the best care. 12% 12, 12 of babies are born premature. 3% have low birth weight, 8% have congenital birth defects, which most of it can be prevented. But look at this, 31% have a pregnancy-related complication during their pregnancy, which most of it could be prevented. There are risk factors that have a poor pregnancy outcome, and they are prevalent in the community, smoking, substance abuse, obesity, teratogenic drugs in the childbearing age groups, over-the-counter drugs that are taken uh, when you're trying to fall pregnant, and you have pre-existing conditions that are not adequately managed before the patient tries to fall pregnant. And, and, and these things need to be, to be addressed and managed and designed in your domain. Uh, I come with patients who come to my, my, my consulting room and they're sitting with two liters of Coke outside drinking Coca-Cola and they'll finish the two liters while they're waiting to see me. I have patients who, 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 who you know, BMI greater than 35. And when I tell them the risk of diabetes and hypertension, uh, they say, no, I'm, this is normal for me. Uh, I don't want to tell you about, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit later about teratogenic drugs. So the, why preconceptual care is vital? Because you can reduce maternal and child mortality. You can prevent un, unintended pregnancies if, it, if you have in your practice uh, a con contraception programs. And those, the Eastern Cape Department of Health is giving out free contraceptions now. If, if people in the Nelson Mandela Bay wants to know how to do it, we can tell you. You can prevent complications of pregnancy and delivery, stillbirths, low birth weight baby stunting. You can prevent vertical transmission of HIV and STDs. I don't want to tell you that at least of all the HIVs that I see at this point in time, still so many of the patients who come, the first time they sit with me, I do the antenatal screen, then they're HIV positive. So you didn't test before, no. And then I have to start the whole counseling program and everything again, which actually could have been done. Type two diabetes, and they'll be sitting there taking all these new drugs, you know, uh, that are now available, fancy drugs. Uh, uh, and all of these, these drugs are contraindicated in, in, in diabetes because it, 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 it has got harmful effects and the drugs have not yet been changed or anything. I have patients who come in there with hypertension, you know, and then you'll find that they are still on ACE inhibitors and ARBs uh, and things like that. And you can definitely, if nothing else today, lower the risk of PET, which I will talk to you about. As the thing is spinning on the top, early antenatal care is too late. I repeat, early antenatal care is too late. We're not even talking about early antenatal care here because if you want an appointment with a specialist, you'll say send the patient at 16 to 20 weeks. So even there, if your nervous system develops at five weeks, your heart at five weeks, your arms, eyes, legs develop here. So you send us the patient at this point in time here when the patient is 12 to 13 weeks. This is all a missed opportunity. And, and so, so we need to, to say, how do we look at that, that missed opportunity, because that is in your domain. We have to change the paradigm from healthy mothers to healthy babies to healthy women and, and get the women healthy before she decides in which they are in, such that the environment is also conducive of them having a healthy baby. Barker's hypothesis is saying that if you have all these problems while pregnancy is taking place at the conception, pre-implant, pre-implantation stage or post-implantation stage, you get a whole lot of things that can happen which can affect the baby for the rest of their life. So preconceptual care is a topic on its own. I don't want to go into that now, Jeff, but I just wanted to say to you, this is a good source that you can look at. It's a book that tells you about all the things that you can do, you know, alcohol, domestic violence, drug abuse, folic acid, supplementation, what you can do there. Chronic disease, how to manage it, how to screen, how to prevent infections, vaccination programs that needs to be done. So it's a good book to get and it's available free online. As a family doctor, the patient is known to you intricately. You know everything about this patient, you know about the maternal conditions, you know about the previous pregnancy conditions. So you are best placed to prepare this patient such that by the time they decide to fall pregnant, they are really healthy and they are ready. I have patients who were on epilepsy from childhood days of sodium valproate is not yet changed. And, and they come to you pregnant with taking sodium valproate as an example. We have patients who come in with asthma and then they have this 
preconceived notion. No, the steroids in my in my in my uh, in my blockers, and uh, I must I've stopped this, this inhaled corticosteroids, and then they get asthma during this and make the baby more exposed because then you have to go with oral steroid. So at that point. You have so many patients who have had a cervical cone biopsy, and you can prevent miscarriage in this patient just by doing a short cut stitch of cervical and circulage, and, and you can look at it. But obesity and smoking and substance abuse, you can prevent this before that happens. Another thing is chronic anemia, which is there. So these are things that you can do. So I'm just going to go through some of it. The first one is tobacco and substance abuse. You have to, before the patients come to us, use the 5 way method, ask, advise, assess, assist and arrange for treatment, provide alternative therapy, look at screening and, uh, uh, and even screening of the non-smokers for secondhand uh, uh, inhalation effects. And if you can get the patients to, to stop this before they come to us, it is really great. Family planning, if you can avoid unwanted pregnancies, this year now in teenage unwanted pregnancies coming sitting to us where termination of pregnancy is becoming a method of contraception is a problem. And you have to also advise patients to say not to delay the pregnancy after 35 because that's also risky. And as I said, you can correct smoking, obesity, supplementation, and, and things like that. But at the same time, as a GP, you have to also educate patients about contraindications to pregnancy. If this patient has got a severe nephropathy, if this patient has got uncontrolled hypertension, uncontrolled diabetes, with severe retinopathy, I've had a young girl just not even three months back, who came in with severe retinopathy, uncontrolled diabetes. She was a state patient. They sent her to me for a 20-week scan. I did the 20-week scan for her. Everything was out for her. At that point in time, we advised termination of pregnancy. They didn't. They continued with the pregnancy. Six weeks later, she was she passed on. And, and, and so it's a contraindication. So you need to educate the patient. You should not fall pregnant. People with active coronary disease should not fall pregnant. So there are certain contraindications to pregnancy and if you can educate them about that. If nothing else, guys, today, all prepubescent women, prepubescent girls in your practice, just make sure they have got an HPV vaccination. The government rollout program now is not effective because it started in certain places in certain schools and it's haphazard. If, the, if it's a prepubescent girl and she's in your practice and and she is there, just get an HPV vaccination for her uh, uh, because it is something that can prevent uh, cervical cancer for in the later stages of her life. Uh, we have to qualify; it doesn't uh, prevent all cervical cancers. Cervical cancers caused by human papilloma virus. In age, in, in child bearing age group, you have to ask. Have the persons got an immunization for mumps, measles, rubella, varicella, HPV, hepatitis B, tetanus, if, if they didn't have a tetanus shot in the last five years, and if they're immunocompromised influenza. Now, I can't tell you how important this is. I had recently a, a, a mother who was teaching in a preschool, and a rubella antibodies was negative, so it means she was not immune. Every day we had sleepless nights and hopefully that no child in the preschool gets rubella and gives his mother rubella. Because any of these diseases, if it occurs during pregnancy, 100% the baby is going to be affected, whether they like it or not. And it's so easy. It was so funny because when I went for my uh, jab now for the, for the uh, coronavirus, I carried my immunization card with me and they said, no, we couldn't do it. But you need to make sure your patients have these immunizations. I have had nurses who come to me and then you ask them, have you been tested for hepatitis B? No, have you been vaccinated? No, but how come you're working in a high risk environment? Now there are many other people who are called frontline workers like police, uh, 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 emergency health services and all. They need to be vaccinated. And if they're women, they definitely need to be vaccinated. And this you should do even before they come to us and so that by the time they fall pregnant, there is no risk of this. So infection with measles, rubella, varicella has a very, very high risk of congenital abnormalities. And this is something that you can do by just checking your patients out and making sure they get the vaccinations that it is there. Making sure that the environment is conducive. 
is important. I've spoken about smoking, alcohol, substance abuse, teratogenic drugs. If I don't want to say to you, last year I had to do some terminations of pregnancies for people who gave Roaccutane to young girls for acne. And when you give Roaccutane, two years after you have given the Roaccutane, that can affect the baby. So if you are deciding to prescribe Roaccutane to a patient or any of the isotretinoin, you need to make a two year a uh, uh, family planning program. Otherwise, you, you, you're putting this person at risk. One of the patients came to me for a 20-week scan and it had a whole lot of abnormalities and we tried to find out what it is. And then later it comes back, no, she had taken raw acutane. And by that time, the horse was bolded. We had to go and apply to the magistrate and other things for termination of pregnancy. It was really a problem. As I said to you, STDs and HIVs can also be prevented. But a little bit from your side, you can look and and stratify whether the person is exposed to any environmental hazards, whether it's chemical, physical, gender-based violence, work environment, biological, or cultural. Cultural exposure to environmental hazards is very important. I have had a young girl who came to visit me the other day, then tried to commit suicide. Why? She's an Indian girl. She fell pregnant. The partner is a black. She can't tell her parents. Next thing. Uh, uh, she came to me and she had an eight-week pregnancy. We confirmed the pregnancy. We look at it. Next thing I'm, I'm found, your patient is here in casualty. Why? Overdose of drugs. Uh, so you need to find out about these things and prepare the patient so that they know. Diet and nutrition is so important. So I've just given you what is a normal BMI, but if the BMI is more than 30, we need to worry. And you can look at total weight gain in pregnancy. Now, in this, the internet is full of knowledge about what you can eat and what you can't eat. But the one I want to say to you, if you can just look at these things here, sugars, if you can decrease the carbohydrate in sugar intake, cool drinks, I can't emphasize enough how much, if I can ban cool drinks, I'll ban cool drinks. Uh, especially these Coca-Colas and other things like that, where people drink two liters of it at a time. So that is there. I was shocked when I had to look at uh, uh, products from uh, underdone eggs. I mean, I, I didn't realize that poached eggs, and, uh, I know, runny yolk eggs, or if you drink an eggnog, or if you eat tiramisu, or if you eat cake batter, hollandaise sauce, these are all having uncooked eggs, which is at the risk of salmonella. We all saw what happened with dysteria when we had uh, uh, unprocessed meat that was there seafoods containing mercury. So you need to give some diet advice to the people so that before they come to us, that is, they have got a, a good diet plan. But the most important thing, if the patient's BMI is over 30 or equal to 30, you've got to restrict the carbohydrates to 35% of the food source. And you have to put them on some diet program. In this, you need a dietitian, and you should look at that at this point in time. Prevention of miscarriages. Pre-pregnancy, all patients that have had a miscarriage should be fully investigated. You know, now what happens, you come to the patients, come to you and they have a miscarriage, you refer them to the specialist, the specialist does an evac and sends the patient. It's a problem because at that point in time, you don't even know what the blood group of the patient was. You don't know whether isoimmunization has taken place. What happens if the patient was Rh negative? What happens if the patient had an underlying cause? I, I, I can tell you something here. One of the doctors that we had here, his wife had eight miscarriages and she had anti-lipid, uh, antiphospholipid antigen syndrome and it was not detected. And once that was detected, we gave Clexane and we gave uh, 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 Ecotrin. She fell pregnant and, and these are things that could be looked at. Uh, any patient that has had miscarriages, you should do a torch screen. <laughs> I've had a lady here who came there, she has had three miscarriages. I did a screen for her and she finds she's got toxoplasmosis and then she's got 20 cats in the house. No, I can't live without my cats. And we had to say, no, fine, then you can't live without your cats. Get somebody else to take out the cat droppings because the cat droppings is going to give you toxoplasmosis, your antibody level for this and you're getting repeated infection for toxoplasmosis. So it's not going to work. So you need to look for these things and, and every my take home point is if a patient had a miscarriage, do a torch screen, know what is the average status of this, of this patient so that you can look at it. 
And this is what I wanted to say. If the people come to you and you do a serial beta HCG, and if you find the patient is at risk, just by giving cyclogest 400 milligrams per vagina for 14 days, and then refer early. For these kind of patients, you need to make the extra effort to pick up a phone and say, Shiva, I got this patient. She's got two miscarriages. Now she's pregnant. Please, I need you to look at it. You phone Louis. Louis, I can tell you something. will say, can the patient come today? And he will make a plan to fit this patient for you. I know him. His heart is gold. And he will help you. If you go to Rene, she will also do that for you. So if you make efforts for that, that can happen. For inevitable and incomplete abortions, when you are referring the patient to the specialist, do a restless grouping. While you're referring the patient, send a restless grouping and say to the, to the specialist, I've sent, I've sent this blood, the results will come to you. Because you, 15% of the people are RH negative and you can cause iso immunization. At the present moment, uh, I'm doing intrauterine uh, blood transfusions at Dora. And, uh, uh, and last year I had to do six of this, which is totally preventable. And of that six, three came from miscarriages where they didn't pick up the patient, was RH negative, just did evax and went off and didn't give any Ds. Now, if you got history of colon biopsy and there, there was an history that the person had any colon biopsy, you should look at cervical and circulage and you should make a plan. A specialist too is too busy, you can do it, you can teach people, you phone us, we will. We'll make a plan for that today. Today, I wanted to talk about hypertension. And the Federation of International Society for Gynecology, Gynecology and Obstetrics put out this textbook. It's available free. This is my source document. I also used uh, the Indian source document, but this, this, this document is quite good. So I've given you the link to it and you can download it. But hypertension is an important thing. I don't want to tell you what is hypertension? What are the classifications of hypertension? Uh, whether the patient has got pre-existing hypertension, gestational hypertension without proteinuria, eclampsia, or, 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 or different types of hypertension this is not important. What I wanted to tell you is this. You can have preeclampsia without proteinuria. If nothing else I've told you today, remember that you can have preeclampsia without proteinuria and it does affect the baby. So there are three types of, of, of this thing. One, where a person goes clearly with full preeclampsia, then you get mixed preeclampsia where it is on a person who's got chronic hypertension and they get superimposed preeclampsia. And then there's another one where the hypertension increases now, doesn't get proteinuria, but get preeclampsia. And it, you get an IUGR and, and, and a smaller baby and you can get problems. So you need to look at this. The complications from PET is enormous, and I don't. I think all of you know it. This is the complications to the mother, and this there's complications to the baby. So the take-home message today is: your if your patient is on hypertensive treatment for pre-existing hypertension before they fall pregnant, don't wait for them to fall pregnant. Before they fall pregnant, put them and change their drugs to safe drugs. If you're going to initiate treatment in hypertension for a person who's in the childbearing age group, then look at drugs that are safe in pregnancy. And then at this point in time, you need to educate this mother. Listen, at some point in time, you may fall pregnant. Let's look at your weight management. Let's look at your exercise program. Let's look at healthy eating. Let's get your diet so you decrease the amount of salt that you take in your food before you fall pregnant so that when you fall pregnant, you're on a safe drug and you become okay. These are the drugs that are safe, methyl dopa. It's been tried and tested from 0.5 grams to two grams per day into two, three divided doses. You can discontinue postpartum because it does cause depression. And then does, you can even include an asymmetric postpartum for a period of time before they fall pregnant again because it does renal protection and things. But pre-pregnancy, you need to look at that. Labitalol is the other drug. Long acting nifedipine, don't use the 5 milligram and the 10 milligram. Nifedipine XL, uh, Cipolet XL, uh, uh, Adelet XL, you can give these drugs in two to three divided doses. Though they say one time a day, you can go one to two times a day. Side effects of this is tachycardia, palpitations, headaches, facial flushing. And you have to educate the patient about this and say, but you know, we're going to have to hold these drugs for you for now because you fall pregnant, you want to fall pregnant. After your pregnancy, we can look at it. Never give this sublingually. It just causes a bloody crash in blood pressure and it's a problem. 
hydrolyzine is another drug that you can use. Amalodipine is, 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 is still classified in many countries as, 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 as class D. But amalodipine, the latest data is coming out that is you can use it. Fetal Medicine Foundation says it's a safe drug and you can use it. So amalodipine, we are using five up to 20 milligrams in pre-pregnancy and during pregnancy. If they, are, if they fall pregnant, we just continue. If the patient is on a low dose hydrochlorothiazide, up to 12.5 milligrams pre-pregnancy, you can continue, but you cannot increase the dose more than 12.5. It does cause IUGR and other problems. These drugs are contraindicated. I've written diuretics here, but as I said to you, uh, less than 12.5, less than or equal to 12.5 hydrochlorothiazide is still acceptable, but every other drug here, you have to stop it. And if possible, if you're thinking that the patient is going to fall pregnant, don't use it. Uh, it, it uh, uh, ACE inhibitors are really teratogenic and, 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 it, and it can cause problems. And so you, you need to know about this so that uh, it, you don't put it on this. The gold standard for PET profile access, I can say to you that 91% of PETs now can be prevented. And this is how you do it. And if I had to say to you, I gave you this prediction charts, you just go to preeclampsia here. Yeah? By the way, all of those charts there I showed you, I'm hoping that this is gonna come up and it will show you. Uh, Jeff, I hope this is visible, but you, if you come to preeclampsia, it will tell you what you need to do. You just put in these parameters here and it will do the risk calculation for you. And that will help you to find out if your patient is preeclampsic or not. You know, I've gone out of my presentation, but let me, come back to where I am now. So that is the gold standard, but I want to teach you something today. And this is a take home message for everybody that is present. Siva. <clears throat> Siva. Yes. I just want to let you know that it is uh, 8.30. So uh, you can continue, but this. you might have to speed up a little bit. I, I, this is the most important slide of today. You can classify your patients based on these three categories of high risk, moderate risk, risk low risk. If the patient is in high risk, this is three points, not at this two points, one point here. If a patient is pre-pregnant and if the patient is up to 14 weeks pregnant, if the patient scores three points or more, start the patient on aspirin 150 milligrams a day at night or two equatron at night with calcium one to 1.5 milligrams, one to 1.5 grams once a day. If you do this, you will prevent 91% of hypertension. And this is the, the purpose of the talk was just to tell you this. Everything else I told you was there. Anemia, I just want to tell you that patients are behind. So if you can start the patients on supplements beforehand, if the patient has got neural tube defects or the patient has got previous miscarriages, folic acid, if the patient is alcoholic, vitamin B12, vitamin B cold, and if the patients on electrolytes, <coughs> look at their uh, diuretics, look at the electrolytes. And as I said to you, the PET, look at this. If the patient has got thyroidism, look at iodine and look at that thing. Thyroid screening is absolutely important. At this present moment, 1% of all women of childbearing age have thyroid problems. Remember that in the first stages of pregnancy, in the first trimester, it increases circulating beta LCG, decreases the TSH, so you, you don't get upset about it if you see it. Always check the T4. Remember also, you can get uh, 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 hyperthyroidism because the placenta, the prostaglandins increase the thyroid binding proteins, and that increases the thyroid thyroxine levels in the patient. So in this year, it, it's important. Remember, 10 to 12 weeks, the Baby is totally dependent on the mother for thyroxine. After 13 weeks, the baby produces thyroxine. So that is there. Now, hypothyroidism and subclinical hypothyroidism is absolutely important. Just even today, I saw a patient that came to, came to me and, and she was on althroxine, 150 micrograms. I looked at her, the TSH for her was 35. That, as I said, when the TSH is high like that, it is transmitted to the baby. And uh, uh, then you can get this baby to get a permanent goiter during the whole pregnancy. And if I looked at the fetal heart rate of the baby today, it was 184. And that's why I'm saying at this point in time, 
Hypothyroidism causes cognitive and neurological developmental disorders. It's easily that you have to do hormone replacement therapy, and you may need to increase 20 to 30 percent of the dose for the person that is there. Therefore, screening becomes important. Hyperthyroidism is another problem. It affects 0.2 percent of all pregnancies, grave diseases, mostly autoimmune thing. The important thing about this is that you have to, if possible, treat hyperthyroidism before the patient before pregnant. High levels of TSH cross the placental barrier, as I said to you, and causes neonatal hyperthyroidism and goitrogen. Neomarcazole, metimarcazole crosses the placental barrier and may cause complete damage to the, to the baby's thyroid and it is not supposed to be used. So these patients should be treated before, and before they fall pregnant. And if they decide to fall pregnant, you should change to PTU. You cannot give radioactive thyroid iodine. If you do that, then you have to give contraception to the mother for six months because it can still affect the mother. Diabetes is another problem that we face. And all I'm going to say here is that there are different types of diabetes. Sarah, yes. just a, a, a brief interruption. Just to inform all the participants that the link to the online registration uh, register has been posted in the chat section. We will not email that link to anybody because once the meeting is over, the link will be closed. So please go to the chat section, uh, click on it, and then complete the register. Thank you. Okay, Take, you know what's the complications of diabetes? Maternal morbidity, fetal morbidity is too much. You know the diagnosis, what's the criteria. This is the take home message here. All mothers that come to you in the antenatal stage under 13 weeks, look for the HbA1c. If the HbA1c is more than 5.4, classify this patient as high risk. If the patient comes to you for your 20 week scan or 24 week scan, Louis knows this, Rene knows this, I know this, we will perform an oral glucose tolerance test. Remember, the oral glucose tolerance test in pregnancy is with 75 grams of glucose, not 50 grams. We've got a new test now which just says give 75 grams of glucose after two hours, check the uh, sugar. If it's more than 11.1, the patient is diabetic. This is the recommendation that we come back where it says that the fasting level is less than five, uh, more than 5.3 of the problem. Postprandial, if it's, I, I need to also state this here. A lot of people think that the long acting insulins work best. The people have a postprandial hyperglycemia. And so, therefore, if you can give the patient short acting, Nova Rapid, or fast acting insulin with every meal, it is better than the, the basal bolus regime for you because you can look at it. In overweight patients, you have to watch what the weight gain is. If the weight gain gets over this, you need to look at it and take it from there. These are the recommendations that is made, but the take home message here is that every patient should be screened for diabetes if the body mass rate is more than 30. If it's more than 35, you start on treatment immediately. And thirdly, uh, at 20 weeks, you should do a, a glucose tolerance test screening. Asthma, I just told you, don't stop the oral corticosteroids because it's safe. Uh, if you want to be fun, uh, very scientific, you can do a nitrous oxide fractional level, get to the optimal dose of-, uh, of Siva, of, uh, one of the participants has raised a hand, Dr. Silliman. Do you have a question or was it an accidental hand? Yeah. Dr. Silliman, do you have a question? They can ask the question. Just Okay, Shiva, go ahead. Okay, asthma, as I said, inhaled corticosteroids are safe, so just let them continue with this. If you want to do, do a nitric oxide fraction, get to the optimal dose of inhaled corticosteroids and then give them, uh, 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 as a controller, you just continue with that and relievers can be just used whenever they're needed. Uh, Many drugs are unsafe in pregnancy. Some of them I just listed here. You can look at it and things like that. Warfarin is the one that comes to mind. ACE inhibitors, methotrexate, denazole, picotrilab, uh, infertility, endometriosis. They treat with denazole. They don't give enough time and they look at it. NSAIDs, especially Arthrotec, because it contains mesoprostol and things like that. So you should look at what drugs are taken. I'm just going to skip through the slide here. Preconceptual care is also for men, it's not just for women is to prepare the men for, for fatherhood 
and it can do a lot of things to prevent illnesses in the man and it's an opportunity. The new approach to medicine is that we should adhere to the teachings of Hippocrates in that we should learn from the past, research the present and predict the future. And the pronouncements of Galileo that the language of the gods is mathematics and we should measure everything that is measurable and, and, and make measurable everything that is not measurable. So if we do risk rating, if we can calculate what the risk is and we can prevent it, that is what we should do then. My closing remarks is this, guys, I've given you and I've told you what is the advantage of premeditative and promotive care in pregnancy, active screening, preconceptual care. You can change lives. And this is not in the domain of specialists. This is in your domain. If you do this, you will make a diff big difference in the life of the mother and the baby. As I said, if nothing else, today's slide should tell you this. Take a good history of that. The patient scores three. Put the patient before 14 to 15 weeks on Ecotrin 2 or half a discipline given at night, calcium one gram to 1.5 grams, 91% you can prevent PET. I participated in a multi-center study on this, and we looked at measuring chest pain with this intervention, taking the history as compared to the FML foundation of checking uh, placental growth factor and looking at the uh, split and other things like that. This found out to be superior and screened all the patients that we screened on the other side. I want to stop there. I want to say primary care, you are the gatekeepers. You are the backbone of a medical care system. It depends on you. You are the foundation on which everybody else works. And you have therefore the opportunity and the obligation to do this for your patients so that they remain healthy. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks very much, Shiva, for that comprehensive and uh, excellent presentation for GPs. And, uh, you know, you know, if I consider my attendance at talks over the years, this is probably the most comprehensive talk on antenatal care to GPs over the years. So I think it would take a GP obstetrician to share this kind of knowledge with fellow GPs without feeling threatened in any way. So thanks very much, Siva, for willingly sharing so much knowledge. Uh, and it was a truly excellent presentation. And um, yes, we will chat regarding um, subsequent presentations. I'm going to open up the floor to questions. And I've set it up Please that, the line. yeah. So firstly, Sorry, colleagues, who is on the, who yes, wants to come in? I'll call him in just now. Colleagues, the register, by just typing your name in the chat section is not going to help because we need all your information. Click on that link. It's simple and complete the register, please, so that we can send you your CPD points. So before I um, request uh, members to ask questions, I request Louis. Um, to to please say a few words from his side. You can unmute Louis. Jeff, before Louis speaks, I need to confess here. My interest in fetal medicine came from Louis. I owe it all to him. And if it was not for him, I wouldn't be where I am today. He's a That's huge resource and it's a blessing to our, our town. Thank you. So also, Siva, just after your tenure as the Superintendent General of uh, Health in the Eastern Cape, you went back and uh, you reinvented yourself as an obstetrician and an expert in fetal medicine. So we salute you for that. Louis, are you able to unmute? Leon Nell, please complete the register by clicking on the link. Dr. Leon Nell, we know you can do it. So, uh, Louis is not responding. Not sure whether he's having any technical issues there. But I'm going to open up the floor to the rest of the colleagues. You are muted at the moment, but unmute and ask your question or raise your hand.
Jeff Solomon's hand is raised. I'm going to just unmute everybody now. Um, yeah. Can you see a hand? Dr. Suleiman, your hand is still raised. Do you, you have a question? Might be an accidental hand. Siva, clearly um, your talk was clear, uh, comprehensive and fully understandable. And if Prithi is there, great to see you. Uh, on the webinar, Prithi, um, you're normally on the other Thanks, side Jeff. of this. Thanks, Jeff. Everything was wonderful. Excellent. Yeah, you're normally on the other side of this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wonderful, Jeff. Thank you. <laughs> Siva was wonderful. was excellent. Most most inspiring, Siva. Fantastic. Yes. Okay, then we got Dr. Motondo. Unmute yourself, Dr. Matondo. Hello. Yes, go ahead, Dr. Matondo. Yes, I would like to know uh, what kind of investigation uh, can I do in case I receive a patient with uh, history of recurrent intrauterine uh, death? <laughs> Did you get that, Siva? Yes, we got that. I, I don't know if I take more questions one time and then I answer, or is it? I think you can answer. Okay, if you got into it, then it's too late. So, what you should do then is to look at termination of the pregnancy. But post intrauterine death, first thing you can do is to send the fetus off. And there is now what is called products of conception. It's very small. You can send out the fetus for histopathology and karyotherapy, so they can give you a reason for the death. If more than 28 weeks, you can do autopsy to find out. But then basically you have to look at it. If there's any chronic illnesses that the patient had that was uncontrolled, you should look at it. If the patient had any, you should do as a basic thought screen, uh, toxoplasma, rubella, uh, cytop uh, cytomegalovirus, uh, 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 herpes. In addition to that, you should look at HIV, you should look at the other infective diseases. Look for group B beta hemolytic streptococcus. But there can be others where the person has chronic renal diseases, diabetes. Now, diabetes has got a propensity where after 38 weeks, you can get sudden fetal death. That is why if a mother is diabetic, it's better to deliver the baby by induction of labor or anything by 38 weeks. If the patient is with PET and things like that. Uh, the point I wanted to say that this PET, blood pressure is not a barometer of how persons are doing. I'll give an example of this. At one of the doctors who the outlying hospitals, his wife had two uh, uh, miscarriages. She fell pregnant. She went to one of the specialists. He wanted an uh, early scan, and a 20 week scan. So they sent the patient to me. I did a full screening. Lo and behold, when she came to me for a full blown PET, we looked at it, we managed it, we gave the complete drugs, but it was really going hard. At one point in time, she had a severe pain. We put in a, 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 a epidural catheter. And the epidural brought the blood pressure down. And that the doctor didn't want to stop the epidural. And it can continue for up to six days. And the blood pressure came so down that we had to stop the, uh, the second line and the third line drug. But it was not improving the baby's care. When we did the Doppler. We had to really go into an emergency operation because there is no correlation between the blood pressure and the blood pressure. So we have to do Doppler. So there are many causes for fetal deaths and we have to look at investigating one of the total. Thank you. Thank you, Siva. Uh, Dr. A. Govinder, you, you had your hand up. Hi. Uh, is that Amendri? Yes, it's Amendri. Hi. Welcome, Amendri. Um, I was... Hi, thanks. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I just wanted to ask Dr. Pillay about... Um, um, we, we, he was going through the uh, contraindications um, uh, uh, where the um, certain uh, drugs that were toxic um, during pregnancy uh, or teratogenic. 
Um, and one of them was corticosteroids. So I was just thinking uh, the oral corticosteroids. If a, if a patient who's in the second trimester of pregnancy and, and um, you know, becomes hypoxic and requires oral corticosteroids, what would be the plan of action for a patient like that? Okay, let's answer the question in this way. Yeah, you have to ask what is the corticosteroid used for? It is used for asthma, you know, uh, uh, and, you know, refractory asthma and things like that. I will ask you to do a nitrogen oxide fraction test and then try to get the oral inhales corticosteroids to the maximum dose that you can and see if you can control that and look at avoiding that. But if it comes to in the second and the third trimester, then be careful of diabetes, mon monitor the diabetes, and you would have to do it. But if you give him the corticosteroids for uh, rheumatoid arthritis and other things like that, one can look at other things for pain at that point in time during the pregnancy period. So you have to find what is the corticosteroids used for. Now, it's not an absolute contraindication for corticosteroids, but you have to see if the use of the corticosteroids is outweighed, outweighs the benefit. Uh, 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 the benefit of it outweighs the, the, the harmful effects of the pregnancy. You can continue the corticosteroids. But you have to find what the corticosteroids is used for. Now, uh, asthma, for example, it can be managed with quite a lot of drugs and quite quite well. Uh, and so I don't you know, very rarely you will need oral corticosteroids for asthma. Uh, uh, but for the other things, you may need it. Uh, 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 and as I said, if you're doing that, watch diabetes, watch growth, watch for uh, 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 side effects in the baby, monitor the baby carefully, and then you can look at it. Use the lowest dose possible. Is there a period of of um uh of use of steroids that that is that is considered to be safe for a period of time in the second uh, trimester? Forty milligrams for five days as a as a has been what was talked about in the last Figo conference said use three times in pregnancy forty milligrams for five days. But it should not more than three times if it's going to be on. Okay, thank you. Shiva, one of the participants asked about uh, the use of anti emetics during pregnancy. Anti emetics depends which ones you use. Uh, for example, if you use clopamon, just remember that clopamon in the early, early stages of pregnancy, when you do in vitro fertilization and things like that, it increases. And it can cause uh, 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 an in vitro fertilization to dislodge from the fallopian tube. So just as you contract and increase the the the, the, the gut uh, motility, you also increase a little bit in the fallopian tubes. In, in vitro fertilization in the early stages, up to six weeks, is a little bit not used. So we don't use that. Uh, Antiemetics that you could do. I start off with the first thing with C bands. If anybody wants to know C bands, just phone my rooms. Zainab will tell them how to get C bands, and we use C bands. And 70 to 80 percent of the patients are controlled on C bands. And the next day, drug is acid that we go for acid one three times a day. Remember, there might be an underlying cause to hyperemesis, and uh, and that is for, uh, uh, folate deficiency, as well as uh, uh, certain drugs that we are using that causes uh, the, the, the uh, hyperemesis. So correct that and you will also uh, get a better outcome. But at the present moment, I'm just going with C-bands. I go in with ASIC. Uh, very rarely do I have to go higher than that. Uh, and then it's correct way of eating and certain foods that you avoid and then you can manage it. Most of yeah, the well, what about Very MX? rarely you need to admit a person for it. What about MX? I have no experience with MX. What does MX contain? Uh, for, for nausea in pregnancy? Do, what do you... MX contain? If I know what the chemical in MX is, then I can tell you. Okay. I'll take other questions in the meantime. Jeff, that I wanted to tell you somebody that somebody put in the chat room, they wanted information and a, and a DVD from us. I can leave some DVDs for you about the ultrasound training, but if they phone my rooms, go for one. 9220465, you can put the number down. And Zainab uh, uh, will Korea. Okay, uh, uh, Siva, give that slow. Oh, 
0.41.9.2.0.4.6.5. Yeah, 0.41.9.2.0.4.6.5. Before Zainab, we have more than 20 DVDs there. It's a kind of step-by-step -step teaches you what to do and gives you a, a training program. I use that for all the training. It's surprising when you're doing internet training now in Uganda, Tanzania, and other places. And you really uh, Siva, there's a, there's a question in the chat. Uh, thank you so much, doctor, for the presentation. I'm not sure if you did touch about something uh, in your first few slides about the prolonged fee for a first consult. Can you please elaborate more about it? If you know better than that about me, about prolonged consultation, if a prolonged consultation goes over 30 minutes to 45 minutes, and your first pregnancy visit will definitely cross 45 minutes if you do everything that is considered in the first pregnancy visit. And you write your first pregnancy visit and you say screening for this, screening for this, all of them for codes. And so I think it's best uh, uh, obstetrics um, for, for GP uh, le lesson with actually good the internet. Yeah, awesome. Sorry, Jeff, I'm losing something here. Yeah, sorry. Jeff, help me. Are you having a problem, sir? No, I had somebody speaking in between. I didn't know what the question was. It was in Afrikaans. Uh, go ahead. Uh, repeat your question, please. Was it Leon? Uh, is it Jeff? Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, is it Leon? Yes. That's me. Sorry, man. I, uh, I'm, I'm so sorry for using my, my native language here. Yeah. Sorry, I just... No, no, um, no but, need to um, apologize. Uh, if you can just repeat I'll, I'll, I'll make it. I'll make it. Uh, I'll make it up to you next time. We can actually meet somewhere and have something to eat together because I miss you guys, honestly. <laughs> Absolutely. No. I don't like the Zoom conferences because I see I see you guys are all getting older. I don't know why, but we, 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 we um, okay. So, so Jeff, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pillai, for that for that um, for that uh, lecture. I, I think that is one of the best lectures I've ever listened to uh, for GPs, and I think uh, it's, it's a message that we should actually have more GPs talk to GPs. Um, but thank you very much for that. I um, I just want to say that uh, I agree with you about the um, about the uh, stopping of some of the drugs. The problem is some of the uh, ladies come and they really on eight for a while. What is the cutoff date for you to be stopping on AIT before the patient is pregnant? Uh, three months. We that's why we said it's not it's not nine, it's twelve. So if you stop off if you stop off if you stop off the ACE inhibitors and all two months before they fall pregnant is fine. Three months is what we look at so that they can readjust to the drugs. So that's what we look at. But if you stop it off just before they fall pregnant, also it is safe. Most of these drugs, if you just stop just before preconception, it is it is also safe. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Leon. So Jeff, the chat box there about anti abuse and things like that. Jeff, if you going to do use that, then you have to use that before the patient falls pregnant, and that is why it is important that antibiotics and things, disulfiram and others be used before uh, persons fall pregnant. And you need to put them into a rehabilitation program before they fall pregnant so that you don't use those things while they're pregnant. Okay, there's a question, sir. For patients on long-term SSRI for chronic depression and are reluctant to stop, what can be used uh, at pre-conception visit? Yeah, uh, uh, the depression is an old topic on its own, Jeff. There are six drugs that are considered relatively safe. They're considered what is class C, which means that if the benefits of it using, using them it outweighs the harmful effects. So you can move to any of those six drugs that are in the class C and, and it is needed. Especially people who have got uh, bipolar disorders, risk of uh, suicide and all, you cannot stop those drugs. And uh, uh, I'll, I'll send you the list of the drugs. Uh, uh, that we, we, we drew up with the FIGO came up with that recommendation, the Federation of International Obstetrics and Gynecologists, and they gave the doses 
and, and what you can use and how to manage it. But counseling should be also accompanied with it. Okay, so the next one is, you have mentioned ultrasound till 22 weeks. Does it mean there is no need for ultrasound beyond this period? No, what we do is that we call a priori rating. So we do an ultrasound at 22 weeks uh, and it depends on what we find. If you find a patient is diabetic, if you find a patient has got PET, then that patient needs to be checked up for growth and Doppler monitoring regularly. But if you find that there is nothing wrong, then you can say to the patient just at 36 weeks, to just come and do an ultrasound again. If you find a low lying placenta, then you can say to the patient, this is your placenta is low, there's a risk of placenta previa. We can't tell you if placenta previa now. Come back at 36 weeks before you deliver. We will check your placenta out and then make a decision at that time. So it depends on what you find in the 20 week scan. And most people, like Louis, myself, or Renee, when we do the 20 week scan, we advise the patient what it is. You know, Louis has got such a big heart. If we say to him, and if this patient needs to come back, you even tell the patient, come back, I won't charge you, just come, we'll look at it. We, we even do that for patients. So uh, 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 it all depends on what you find in the 20 week scan. I just wanted to say to you, the 20 weeks is not just the scan, Jeff. I hope I made that clear today. The 20 weeks, you have to do certain things. In the 20 weeks, you have to do cervical length evaluation. You have to do the risk of diabetes when you do the oral glucose tolerance test. You have to do other screening things that is very important. You have to then see that the measures that you put at 13 weeks are working and, and then evaluate the person. It's not just a scan, but it does does the anomaly scan and it's very important. Uh, Siva, is the use of Zofran, Z-O-F-R-A-N, safe for use as antiemetic in early pregnancy? It's been used. The FIGO, all the other drugs are not working. I think it's called odentazone, or something like that. Odentazone. And so it is, can be used. Can be used. Are there any contraindications? But, uh, really, you need to go. Okay. Are there any contraindications or caution for use of fertility drugs? No, there is no contraindications or anything, but if you look at the, the risk, and this, this I need to, to tell somebody what is happening. It, it, people spend so much money going for infertility, you get my point. And then they, they, they end up with, with a pregnancy. And if we looked at what we said there about infertility, it is one of the highest factors. You should put this patient on 150 grams, a milligrams of this because just three weeks ago, I had a patient who went in for in vitro fertilization. The in vitro fertilization came to me. Uh, Louis did the 30 weeks scan for her. Then she came back and Louis recommended her to come and see us. Lo and behold, she came in at 20 weeks. She's got PET. It was a mission we managed to bring the blood pressure down and we had to do a lot of heroic things, but we had to then take off the baby at 980 grams. The baby is now sitting at 1.4 kgs, but just 150 milligrams of this period. I finished it. Uh, Jeff, I lost you. Yeah, yeah. I, I... Something went wrong there, but I'm back. Um, I'm just checking for further questions. Um, I don't see any hands. Any hands? Colleagues, um, any, any further questions? I think uh, it is now nine o'clock, Siva. Um, we start, we, at the maximum, we had uh, about 94 colleagues present from all over the country. And, you know, at nine o'clock, we still have 53 participants. It just shows how interested everybody is. And um, thanks very much to you for a most engaging and comprehensive presentation and for freely sharing your knowledge. We will chat about subsequent presentations. And if anybody has any suggestions uh, for future talks, 
please post it in the chat before you go. And uh, Sean, do you want to close with a vote of thanks? Oh, Gavin? Uh, I learned one thing here. Not only. I did it. I somehow found out how to do it. Somehow managed it. Jeff, can I close now? Yes, please close. Please Jeff, close. Okay. Okay, thank. Can you hear me, Jeff? Yes. Can you hear you? Can you hear Okay. Okay, so th thanks, colle thanks, colleagues, for coming out this evening and listening to this interesting presentation by the versatile Dr. Siva Pillay. I think it was informative and we all learned something. And we must just remember to, to take our messages that he's given. Um, I'm sure we will all be back for more. Thanks very much, Dr. Siva Pillay, for your expertise and, and sharing your knowledge. I'm very grateful. Thanks everyone. Thanks for everyone for coming. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks uh, Sean and Gavin for your support. Thanks, Siva, once again. Siva, um, you, it's fine for us to email the presentation to whoever wants to receive it. Okay. Uh, for me, thank you very much for the opportunity. I must say thank you to Louis again for who was my mentor and inspiring me to come to this point. And uh, I hope that uh, if there are more topics that is important because I went through so many things. So uh, it's a topic on its own. And it's not necessary that I have to give the presentation, but it will be nice if the people can get those presentations because they can make a big difference uh, to how we manage our patients. Thank you. Thank you, Siva. Thanks, colleagues. Good night. Take care and stay Good safe. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night, everybody. Thanks, Siva. Good night. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thank nice. you. Thanks so much.